Dear friends, we find ourselves in the fourth week of our sermon series entitled Five Cups of Coffee. In it, we have been exploring our call to discipleship. We've been talking about our calling, our spiritual gifts, and our passions. Today, we'll be talking about spiritual growth. Our scripture lesson for this morning is Romans 12, 1 through 8. This passage is about our new life in Christ, and I will read it into your hearing. Hear now the word of the Lord. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we are many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually, we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given us, prophecy, in proportion to faith, ministry, and ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, if you will notice, I am not sitting at the high-top coffee table. I am convinced that high-top coffee chairs are created by and for giants. (laughs) Yes. For people like Pastor Andy, who is 15 inches taller than I am, I cannot get into that high-top coffee chair safely or gracefully. I cannot climb into that chair with ease. Trust me, it is not pretty. (laughs) No, I considered standing by the table, but I could already hear your short jokes. And I knew that I would not be easily seen from that vantage point. So I stand here at the top of the stairs, to be both seen and safe. (laughs) My dear friends, there is nothing that I can do to grow taller. That ship sailed the summer after fourth grade. Back then, I was actually tall, but I stopped growing. And in a manner of years, I went from being kind of tall to downright short. There is nothing that I can do to grow taller, but thankfully, thankfully, there is something that I can do to grow spiritually. It's God's will that we would grow spiritually, that we would mature in our faith. It's God's will that we would better resemble Jesus, that we would embody his character, that we too would live by the Spirit, be guided by the Spirit, bear fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, to 23 states that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When we grow in our faith, when we mature spiritually, we are indeed more loving, more joyous, more peaceful, more patient. 
We're kinder, more generous, more faithful. We're gentler, and we do indeed have more self-control. My dear friends, the Holy Spirit grants us the grace to bear spiritual fruit and to resemble Christ. And yet there are still some things that we can do to grow spiritually. In our scripture lesson for this morning, we are encouraged to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. According to John Ortberg, in the life that you've always wanted, we're able to grow spiritually, to renew our minds by training rather than trying. Last year, I registered for a marathon in an effort to dream big and to live my best life. I signed up for the race. I paid the fee. I researched marathon training schedules. I had the best of intentions. I planned to walk the 26.2 miles. Walking is my strange combination of jogging and walking. And I know that I am slow as molasses. I hadn't planned to break any records or to maintain a particular pace. I wasn't going for speed, merely completion. For you see, my superpower is endurance. I knew that if I just kept putting one foot in front of the other, I would be able to make my dream a reality. I would be able to make my goal obtainable. I had the best of intentions. I had pure motives. I had the will and the power, but I did not train. Training was not my priority. I was distracted by all the good stress in my life, like adjusting to a new city and to a new appointment, like preparing for a wedding and a healthy marriage. And when it came time to walk my marathon, I simply was not ready. No amount of trying would enable me to complete that race. It was not humanly possible at that time. My dear friends, marathons require training. So I had to scale back on my dream and walk a half marathon instead. There is a difference between trying and training. Spiritual growth requires training. It requires intention and accountability. We grow in our faith when we draw closer to God through spiritual practices like worship and prayer and reading our Bibles and fasting and taking communion and sharing our faith. By spending more time with God, by allowing God to take us deeper in our faith, we more fully know God and love God. We're better able to follow Christ and imitate Christ. We're better able to resemble and see Jesus' character embodied in us. We're more inclined to grow, and even more than grow, to thrive. My dear friends, it is God's will that we would grow spiritually, that we would mature in our faith, that we would better resemble Jesus, that we would embody his character, that we would live by the Spirit, be guided by the Spirit, bear fruit of the Spirit. But our spiritual growth is not merely for our own edification. It's not solely for our own benefit. We resemble Christ that we might better imitate Christ. My dear friends, our renewed minds have the power to transform our lives and also to transform this world. In his sermon, Transformed Nonconformity, 
Martin Luther King Jr. encourages Christians to be more like a thermostat than a thermometer. A thermometer confirms temperature, whereas a thermostat transforms temperature. As Christians, we are to transform the temperature of society because of our faith, because of our call to follow Christ, because we resemble Christ and embody his character, because our minds have been renewed by the Holy Spirit, we are able to transform our world, to positively change it for God's sake. Some of you know that I went to a small, private, independent boarding school in St. Louis. The school prided itself in giving its students the strongest possible academic background through a classical education. They wanted us students to develop a responsibility for our own learning, a desire to lift up the world with beauty and intellect. I was a day student for most of my high school career, but there were five-day boarders who went home on the weekend and seven-day boarders who lived on campus throughout the school year. While we were there, we had a record high number of students, 75 in grades 7 through 12. There were eight people in my senior class, and I was the only girl. I started the school in ninth grade with four girls in my class. My first year at the school, the boys chose to harass just one girl. They gave her a hard time. They picked on her relentlessly. I felt terrible for her, but I did nothing. I was happy they weren't messing with me. And at the end of that year, that girl left the school. And we are down to three girls in my grade. And as per their usual, the boys in our sophomore class chose just one girl to harass. They gave her a hard time. They picked on her relentlessly. I felt terrible for her, but I did nothing. I was happy that they weren't messing with me. And by the end of the year, that girl left the school. We are down to two girls, and you know the story. The boys picked on the other girl in the class, and they gave her a hard time, and they picked on her relentlessly. And I felt so terrible for her, but I did nothing. I was happy that they weren't messing with me. And at the end of the year, that girl left. And the school realized that I would be the only girl in my senior class. And so they actively recruited all summer long and ended up accepting two new boys to the class. I was still the only girl in my graduating class. And per the usual, the boys chose one girl to harass, and they gave me a hard time. They picked on me relentlessly. I felt terrible for myself. And I was finally forced to do something because they were messing with me. My dear friends, our renewed minds are not solely for our own edification, but they are for the transformation of the world. They're not solely for our own benefit, but to allow us to positively change the world for God's sake. They permit us to stand up for what is right, to speak up for people in need, to share God's love in the face of hate, to proclaim peace in the midst of chaos, to be kind when others choose to be rude, to alter the temperature in our society, to be a thermostat and not a thermometer. My dear friends, Jesus did not come to conform to the world. He didn't go along to get along. 
He, he didn't stick to the status quo or take the path of least resistance. He didn't yield to group pressure. He didn't keep his mouth shut or his head down when he witnessed injustice and oppression in the world. He didn't merely confirm the temperature in his society. No, he was like a thermostat. He transformed the temperature in the world. He spoke up for people who were mistreated and misunderstood, for people who were harassed and given a hard time for people who were alienated and isolated. He looked out for the vulnerable, feeding the hungry, healing the sick, raising the dead, providing hope for the hopeless. Jesus did not conform to the world. Rather, he proclaimed a new kingdom, one that was near one where love lingers and justice reigns and peace prevails. He modeled spiritual strength and moral courage in the face of division and distrust, all while calling us to be like him, to imitate him, to follow him, to be nonconformist to not rebels without a cause, but people of conviction who are building God's kingdom here on earth, even as it is in heaven. He calls us to be, in King's words, transformed nonconformist. People whose minds are being renewed by drawing closer to God, by loving God, by choosing to love all of God's children. He calls us to be transformed nonconformist. People who live by the Spirit, are guided by the Spirit, who bear fruit of the Spirit. He calls us to be transformed nonconformist. People who develop a responsibility for their own spiritual learning and seek to lift up the world with beauty and love and grace. He calls us to be transformed nonconformist, people who prioritize their spiritual training, people who run or walk the race that is set before them, strengthened and empowered by the gift of endurance people who continually fix their eyes on Jesus and seek to share his love with all. My dear friends, on Sunday mornings, I always engage in pre-worship. I listen to Christian music as I prepare my heart and mind for service. And this morning, a song came on. It was a song that I wasn't familiar with. It was by Christine Muller, entitled Homeward Bound. I will pray this song as we close. Won't you pray with me? Oh God, we will run, we will run this race, and we will do it all for love. Your love compels us forward. Your love controls our hearts. And we just can't, we just can't get away. And so we will fight this good fight of faith. And we will do it all for love, for you are our great reward. You're so worth fighting for, and we can't wait. We can't wait to see your face. Hallelujah and amen.